Okay, good morning. Uh, today's discussion is about the virtue ethics of Aristotle. Before we will discuss the virtue ethics of Aristotle, let us uh, discuss first the background of who is this Aristotle. Aristotle belongs to the Greek triumvirate. So when you say triumvirate, meaning they are those uh, group to be composed of three people wherein uh, they were considered to be the founders or they are the ones who laid the foundation of certain fields. So in the field of philosophy, for example, so we have the Greek triumvirate. Okay? So, and it is actually being credited to Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. So who is this uh, Socrates? Socrates was the teacher of Plato, but he wrote nothing. He just keep on talking. He just keep on preaching. He just keep on educating the young you know, in Athens without writing anything. So why we know Socrates? So we know Socrates because of Plato. Most of the works of Plato, especially in his dialogues, his character was Socrates. Socrates held that virtue is a kind of knowledge and that anyone who knows what virtue is cannot help but act virtuously. So for Socrates, the uh, one of the famous quotes about Socrates is, the unexamined life is not worth living. Another one, we have the, I know that I do not know. That is why I need to ask questions. Okay? These are uh, the famous uh, statements no, from Socrates, okay, which is also the foundation of ethics, that the unexamined life is not worth living. Most remarkably, Socrates argued here that knowledge and virtue are so closely related that no human agent ever knowingly does evil. Only if you know that it is good, then you will do it. And only if you know that it is bad, then you will not do it. So improper conduct then can only be a product of our ignorance rather than a symptom of weakness of the will. So that is according to Socrates. Okay? We do bad things because we don't know it is bad. No? So it is actually a product of our ignorance. Because uh, normally, if uh, people know what is good, then he will do what is good. If he knows that it is bad, then he will not do it in a normal situation. Another uh, Greek triumvirate, we have Plato. So as mentioned, Plato is the uh, student of Socrates. And later on, he became the teacher of Aristotle, which is our uh, philosopher for today. Though influenced primarily by Socrates to the extent that Socrates is usually the main character of many of Plato's writings, he was also influenced by Heraclitus, Parmenides, and the Pythagoreans. Okay? These uh, philosophers were also known as the Ionian philosophers, no? the pre-Socratic philosophers, those philosophers who live in Ionia, still in Greece. Plato's philosophy is the source of many famous literary tropes and myth no? that includes the idea of the platonic love, no? the ideal love. Okay, the concept of the philosopher king, no? that only those uh, who are philosophers are... has the capacity to rule uh, in a certain uh, metropolis. And the allegory of the cave or the metaphor of the cave. So these are the works of Plato. So another one, we have Aristotle, which is our main philosopher no, for this uh, discussion. Aristotle is a towering figure in ancient Greek philosophy. And he is known not only in philosophy, but also in most of the sciences, no, like physics, biology. He was also known as the father of biology. We also have this uh, Aristotelian logic, no, the syllogistic logic. We have the metaphysics. No, we know metaphysics still work of Aristotle that is beyond physics. It talks about the anima. It talks about things that is beyond the physical. So we have the ethics of which our discussion for today, the virtue ethics of Aristotle. He is also known in that uh, politics. Now we're in According to Aristotle, man is a political animal. Also in agriculture, in medicine, in dance, and in theater. Aristotle is known in, in most of those fields. Aristotle was a student of Plato who in turn studied under Socrates. Plato, under Socrates. So si Aristotle is under Plato. He was more empirically minded than Plato and Socrates. No? Because uh, Plato and uh, Socrates were known to be idealists. No? They believe in 
forms before the material things. While uh, Aristotle is more empirical in that approach. No? In his epistemology, he believed that ideas actually are just a product of our experiences. And he is famous no? of this for rejecting the uh, theory of forms of Plato, although uh, he was a favorite student of Plato and Plato was maybe his favorite teacher. But in terms of the ideas, he rejected Plato's theory of forms. For Aristotle, he was also the founder of the Lyceum, a school of learning based in Athens, uh, still in Greece. Now, with uh, regarding our topic, the uh, virtue ethics of Aristotle actually came from the, his book in Nicomachean Ethics. So the Nicomachean Ethics came from that word Nicomachus, attributed to either to the father or to the son of Aristotle, Nicomachus. Okay, Nicomachean Ethics is a philosophical inquiry into the nature of the good life for a human being. Aristotle begins the work by positing that there exists some ultimate good toward which, in the final analysis, all human actions ultimately aim. So we will discuss the term later on. The term is eudaimonia because Aristotle also posited the causal theory of things, that everything has a telos. Everything has an end or goal. The necessary characteristic of the ultimate good that it is complete, final, self-sufficient, and continuous. This good toward which all human actions implicitly or explicitly aims is happiness. And the Greek word for that, as mentioned, it is eudaimonia. No? Eudaimonia is somehow like a state no? or it is a life of flourishing, no? which can also be translated as blessedness or living well, and which is not a static state of being, but a type of activity which everybody aims. No? For example, uh, why you want to go to work? Because you want to earn money. Why you want to earn money? Because you want to buy things. And why you want to buy things? For you to have something. But at the end, it will go to the ultimate cause which is you want to be happy. And we do things because we want happiness. For example, you want to graduate, you become successful. But uh, in the end, all you want is happiness. And that in Greek translated no, as eudaimonia. Now, uh, before discussing ethics of Aristotle, no, there are two main theories in ethics, which is also uh, very important to mention. We have the consequentialism and the deontological theories. Okay, these are the two main theories in ethics. However, consequentialism, okay, from that word consequence, meaning it depends on the result. You know? It focuses on judging the moral worth of the results of the actions. And the other one, the deontological ethics, you know? deontological, that means duty. You know? meaning it focuses on the judging on the actions themselves. Okay? So for consequentialism, it uh, focuses on the result, while the ontological focuses on the very act in itself. Okay? This is about the action. No? Uh, for consequentialism, it is popularized by uh, John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham. Okay, they propose the idea that the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people. Okay, so no matter how you do it, as long as the result is good and many people are happy about the result, then that is considered to be good. Uh, this is the guiding principle of the utilitarianism. On the other hand, the other uh, the biggest proponent of the ontological ethics was Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher, who said that moral rules should be adhered to if universalizing the opposite would make an impossible world. Meaning for Immanuel Kant, we need to follow something that can be universalized. Now, uh, for the fundamental question, many of us ask this question, what should I do? No? Even for the, the ontological or the utilitarian, uh, they ask this question, what should I do or how should I act, which is considered to be uh, ethical or good. Uh, 
But for virtue ethics, we'll find out that the fundamental question is not what should I do or how should I act, but what kind of person should I be? So this question now will give us the clear distinction between the deontological perspective of Kant and the consequentialism of Bentham and John Stuart Mill. Okay? Because for Aristotle, the very question now is on the very person, not on the consequence, not on the very act in itself, but on the very person. Okay. So virtues are attitudes, dispositions, or character traits that enable us to be and to act in ways that develop this potential. They enable us to pursue the ideals we have adopted, like honesty, courage, compassion, generosity, fidelity, integrity, fairness, self-control, Prudence. No? These are examples of uh, virtues. Aristotle distinguishes two kinds of virtue. Those that pertain to the part of the soul that engages in reasoning. Okay? That is virtues of the mind or virtues of the intellect. And those that pertain to the part of the soul that cannot itself reason but it is nonetheless capable of following reason. Okay, these are the ethical virtues, or we know as the virtues of character. Virtue is moral excellence. A virtue is a trait or quality that is deemed to be morally good and thus is valued as the foundation of principle and good moral being. Now, when you say excellence here, for Aristotle, that means it can be only be achieved by practicing, no? by practice. That is why for Aristotle, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. Meaning it is a habitual no? activity that you, need, you, that you need to do in order for you to become excellent. Okay. Now, a low-grade form of ethical virtue emerges in us during childhood as we are repeatedly placed in situations that call for appropriate actions and emotions. But as we rely less on others and became capable of doing more of our own thinking, we learn to develop a larger picture of human life. Our deliberative skills improve and our emotional responses are perfected. Like anyone who has developed a skill in performing a complex and difficult activity, a virtuous person takes pleasure in exercising his intellectual skills. Furthermore, when he has decided what to do, he does not have to contend with internal pressures to act otherwise. For Aristotle, all free males are born with potential to become ethically virtuous and practically wise. Okay, so uh, why is it that free males? That is because uh, in the concept of Aristotle in the ancient period, when he said man is a rational animal, he is specifically referred to the male species. No, That is how uh, sexist um, ancient philosophy. But to achieve these goals, they must go through stages during their childhood they must develop the proper habits and then when their reason is fully developed they must acquire the practical wisdom or what we call the pronesis okay but take note this does not mean that the first we fully acquire no, the ethical virtues and then later on in the later stage of our life we add on practical wisdom no, for Aristotle it is not ethical virtue is fully developed only when it is combined with practical wisdom so how does a person develop these virtues okay. virtues are developed through learning and through practice no? as uh, mentioned a while ago that we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act but a habit. Aristotle suggested a person can improve 
his or her character by practicing self-discipline, while a good character can be corrupted by repeated self-indulgence, meaning even if you are good, but if you will not give attention no, to that goodness that you have, it will be corrupted, no, especially by the society that is so corrupt. So tendency, if you will not do good always, tendency, you will become lazy and you will not do things as expected of you. Just as the ability to run a marathon develops through much training and practice, so too does our capacity to be fair, to be courageous, or to be compassionate. So we need to practice these uh, things for us to develop this what we call virtues. Almost any modern versions no, of this uh, virtue ethic still shows that its roots are in Greek philosophy by the employment of these three basic concepts no, that we derive. We have the arete, or the excellence or virtue, the pronesis, the practical or the moral wisdom, and the eudaimonia, usually translated as happiness or flourishing. Okay, so when you say arete, Everything has this what we call excellence. Things can only be considered good if they function properly. For example, a knife can only be considered good if, if it cuts. No? Or a ball pen is considered a good ball pen. When you use the ball pen, it will uh, function as a ball pen. Uh, you can draw using your ball pen. Okay? Then that ball pen is considered to be Good. Same thing with man. What is the arete for man? Man, according to Aristotle, is a rational animal. So meaning, with the use of our rationality, with the use of our reason, that we become excellent. We affirm our being a human being if we use our rationality. The pronesis, as mentioned, this is a practical wisdom, a moral wisdom that we need to develop if we want to have this uh, virtue ethics of Aristotle. And the eudaimonia, this is our uh, end goal, the life of flourishing, the life of happiness. Virtue ethics is primarily concerned with traits of character that are essential to human flourishing, not with the enumeration of duties, as the deontological uh, ethics would uh, insist. Uh, it falls somewhat outside the traditional dichotomy between the deontological ethics of Kant and the consequentialism of Bentham or John Stuart Mill. That is because the very concern of virtue ethics is the very person himself, not his act, not the consequence of his act, but how the person develops this uh, character. You know? Virtues are important because they are the basic qualities necessary for our well-being and happiness. By recognizing the importance of virtues in our lives, it will lead to better communication, understanding, and acceptance. Acceptance between us and our fellow men. Aristotle describes ethical virtue as a hexis or a state, a condition, a disposition, a tendency induced by our habits to have the appropriate uh, feelings. The defective states of character are hexes, a condition as well, but they are tendencies to have inappropriate uh, feelings. We'll find out later on when we discuss on the doctrine of the mean. So virtues are habits, that is, once they are acquired, they become characteristic of a person. For example, a person who has developed the virtue of generosity is often referred to as a generous person because he or she tends to be generous in all circumstances. Moreover, a person who has developed virtues will be naturally disposed to act in ways that are consistent with moral principles. The virtuous person is the ethical person. Furthermore, every ethical virtue is a condition, intermediate uh, between the two states. Okay? This is what uh, Aristotle called as the golden mean. 
It is also uh, popularly known as the Goldilocks theory. One involving excess and the other one involves deficiency, which is considered to be a vice. So, so golden mean only those things that are in between. Now, in this respect, Aristotle says that virtues are no different from technical skills. Now, every skilled worker knows how to avoid excess and deficiency. So not too much, not too little. Now, it is the, just the way it is. Okay? And it is in a condition intermediate between these two extremes. Okay? For example, a courageous person. A courageous person judges the same dangers are worth facing and others are not. And experiences fear to a degree that is appropriate to his circumstances. Okay? So, courage, for example... No, a courage, what do you mean by courage? Is by being reckless a virtue? Okay. According to Aristotle, it is not. It is the excess of courage, no, recklessness. And the other one, the cowardice, is also a deficiency no, of courage. Okay. So, courage lies in between cowardice and recklessness. Here are some of the examples. In the sphere of feelings or action. So we have the virtue as the courage and uh, cowardice or the recklessness are considered to be vice no? because they are considered to be the excess or the deficiency. Okay, temperance, for example, in sensibility no? is a vice. While self-indulgence is also a vice. Okay? These are examples no, of exist and uh, deficiency. Liberality, meanness, and prodigality are considered to be the vice. So, for example, truthfulness. We have this uh, mock modesty or boastfulness are considered to be vices. In every practical discipline, the expert aims at a mark and uses right reason to avoid the twin extremes of excess and deficiency. But what is the right reason and what standard is it to be determined? This is the horos or the standard. According to Aristotle, unless we answer this question, that we will be none the wiser, just as a student of medicine that will have failed to master his subject if he can only say that the right medicine to administer are the ones that are prescribed by medical expertise but has no standard other than this. So for Aristotle, we need to have a deeper explanation or reason why we need to do such thing. It is not easy to understand the point Aristotle is making here. He has not already told us that there can be no complete theoretical guide to ethics. Now, that is why for virtue ethics, it has no rules. No? There is no book to be followed, just like the deontological and the utilitarian uh, perspective. For the virtue ethics, no? just to be a good person no? and all your actions will be considered good. Okay? That the best one can hope no? for this is in particular situation, one's ethical habits and practical wisdom you know, will help one determine what to do. Furthermore, Aristotle nowhere announces in, his, uh, in the remainder you know, of the book 6 you know, in his Nicomachean Ethics that we have to achieve a greater degree of accuracy that he seems to be looking for. So meaning, uh, the development of one's uh, virtue lies on the very person. Okay? And at the heart of the virtue approach to ethics is the idea of community. A person's character traits are not developed in isolation, but within and by the communities to which he or she belongs, including the family, the church, the school, and other private and public associations. Okay, that is why for Aristotle, it is also very important to consider this what we call the moral exemplars, those people whom we uh, imitate no? their good uh, character. Okay? As people grow and mature, their personalities are deeply affected by the values that their communities prize, by the personality traits that their communities encourage, and by the role models and their communities 
put forth for imitation through traditional stories, fiction, movies, television, and so on. So that is why moral exemplars are very important in developing our moral character. Now, uh, before discussing, the virtue approach urges us to pay attention to the contours of our communities and the habits of character they encourage and instill. Moral life, then, is not simply a matter of following moral rules and of learning to apply them to specific situations. The moral life is also a matter of trying to determine the kind of people we should be and of attending to the development of character within our communities and ourselves. Okay, strengths of uh, virtue ethics. Okay, there are many, but I will mention only four. Okay, first, character traits. Virtue ethics deals with a person's virtues and how he or she uses them in making the lives of people better. If a person has virtues, he or she can act morally and will be able to treat others with respect, compassion, and love. These virtues prompt a person to do good things to others because these are innate in him or her, as opposed to the theory of Kant where people are forced to do good deeds out of duty. Number two, better people. Virtues such as generosity, honesty, compassion, friendliness, assertiveness, and the like are already present in people and should be practiced in everyday living. The theory of virtue ethics makes it possible for people to be better individuals and members of society who are willing to help other people. Thinking of others, first over personal interest, with these virtues, people become better persons. And it is also an agent-centered or the person-centered. Another wonderful attributes of uh, virtue ethics is its centeredness or focus on the character of the moral agent and not concerned on consequence in duty or obligation. This also makes it flexible since it allows an individual to decide depending on his or her moral values and not just by simply following the law. Okay. And number four, the preservation of goodness. According to Tacitus, you know, people can be easily corrupted with power and luxury, which can impede liberty. Having said this, virtue ethics serves as a shield against polluting the minds of individuals and making them bad people. Instead, this approach makes it possible for an individual to preserve and make better the life he or she already has and enjoy it rather than dream a life with luxury and power.